Join Pastor Clayton Shepherd as he begins a message entitled Living Under an Open Heaven. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 11, we've talked about the new year, 2011, straight from heaven. Amen. 2011, straight from heaven. And you know, it's interesting because, you know, with each hour and day that passes, um, literally, literally, uh, you know, there's for us, the people of God, not only us, the people of God, but, you know, uh, the whole world, um, the end gets closer. But, you know, when you think in terms of, um, of us, the covenant people of God, the children of God, uh, with each hour and day that passes, really, it's, uh, you know, we're closer, closer to heaven. And um, I believe with all my heart we're at the end of the age. I, I think that um, it's very easy to see. You, know, you, have to, you don't have to go very far or have great, great command of Scripture to know and be able to discern and see that we are at the end of the age. These are the last of the last days. And, um, you know, the Bible paints a a uh, very clear picture of that. You know, for instance, and we refer to this from time to time, that Jesus said in the last days, um, men's hearts would fail them for fear of looking after what was coming on the face of this earth. It said in that time there would be, you know, earthquakes. You know, I, you, you don't go very long without hearing uh, about an earthquake somewhere. Uh, in the earth, I mean, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's almost a daily thing. You hear a report. I heard a report that um, the, um, uh, there was a shift, you know, in the, um, the poles, the north and south pole, uh, I guess you'd call it the axis of the earth, and um, there was a shifting, and there was such a, uh, it shifted to such, such an extent much uh, greater shift than, um, you know, normally occurs that they had to um, repost uh, signs on the runways of um, an airport. I believe it was in Miami. And um, so you're, you're seeing, you know, natural things occur that um, is rising. They are rising to a level that, that you know, man doesn't have the ability really nor the wherewithal or knowledge to, to fully deal with it or have answers for it. And, and when Jesus talked about the end times, he said that, um, that there would be um, distress of nations trying to deal with um, the upheaval in the earth, the, the um, you know, the calamitous type situations. Um, and he said that um, that distress of nations would begin to arise, not just distress of a nation, but nations, plural. And it said that that distress of nations would be with perplexity. And um, so we see at the end of this age, rapidly, you know, we are in a time and, and um, certainly progressively moving into that time that um, even the, you know, most powerful nations and leaders on the faces, face of this earth um, don't have the ability, you know, to deal with the things that are going on in the earth, you know. And it's interesting because when you just talk in terms of, um, you know, world finance or, or global finance, however you want to term it, um, uh, you know, nations are rocking and reeling and... Um, you know, I guess you might say exposed financially like never before. And, um, you know, I don't think we understand how fragile, how fragile the global economy is. What affects one nation affects other nations. And it ripples across the earth, you know, in, in a, in a, at a very rapid, rapid pace. And, um, you know, man is just coming to the end per se, of himself. Uh, man is coming to the end of, of his um, ability, you know, 
to, to manage things. I don't know how to say it any other way. You know, you talk about our nation alone, um, our federal, you know, our national uh, debt. Um, you know, the deficit is one thing. That's uh, what happens, you know, over a year, how much the country runs as far as a, decep uh, a deficit over one year, which is, you know, and now over a trillion dollars in a year. But then when you think about the national um, debt as a whole, it just passed the $14 trillion point. And, um, you know, generally speaking, most people don't think a whole lot about it because, you know, they just don't, you know, what, what is $14 trillion? Well, I can tell you this, it is a bunch. It is a bunch, and it is beyond managing. And, um, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be an effort to, to um, begin to, uh, you know, uh, endeavor to, to bring that, you know, uh, bring some fiscal discipline, however you want to term it. But, um, you know, I, I'm telling you that, that uh, the times and days in which we live are, are a lot more uh, fragile than what any of us really really fully understand or know. And again, you could have one event, you could have one event in the Middle East, which that's a cauldron of, um, it's a hotbed, it's a cauldron of, of um, you know, of, of, of constant tension and, and, you know, striving. And the Scripture, you know, the Scripture doesn't leave us um, blind to this. I mean, God spoke of this thousands of years ago, but um, you could have one event in the Middle East uh, that would, uh, you know, affect the supply of oil to the world to such a degree that it would impact economies, um, you know, just overnight impact economies and, and, and just shake, shake the world. And what I'm trying to say is this, the world system you know, is a broken system. And God, you know, we as God's people and God's children, we're in this world. We're in this world, or the Bible uses the word cosmos there, world order. But we're not of this world. You know, what are we of? We're of God. You are of God, little children, and have already overcome them the devil, the kingdom of darkness, the rulers, you know, wicked spirits in high places that endeavor to, you know, rule over regions and, and influence, um, you, know, uh, you know, influence nations and regions. And, and so we've already overcome them, for greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And, um, you know, the difference is the world has a, its system and it's broken. And it's failing. It's in a constant state of degeneration, or you could say a constant state of moving closer and clo closer towards ruin, you know. And, um, uh, you know, to contrast that, we're in the kingdom of God, or we're God's family, and God has a system. Again, we're in this world, you know, but we're not of this world. We're of God, and, and so it becomes vitally important for us to hear, you know, what the Spirit of God is, is saying in our generation and in our time. And um, let's just start reading here in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 2011, for God's people, for God's people and those that come to the knowledge of God. 2011 is a year straight from heaven. There'll be more heavenly interventions, there'll be more heavenly manifestations, or you might say manifestations of God's power and presence, things are going to escalate in this year. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be in position to um, not only benefit from God manifesting, you know, His mighty power, His mighty protective hand, His mighty provision in this day and hour in which we live, but we also need to be a conduit 
by which God's power can be manifested through us to influence others. And you make no mistake about it, if you're a Christian and the people around you, you know, where, whatever your vocation is, wherever you work, you know, the real world that you live in, the people around you, you know, that know that, they're watching you. They got their eye on you. Now, you know, certainly you have people that don't want, you know, they're ashamed. You know, literally it boils down to that they're ashamed of Christ and they're ashamed of their Christianity and try to hide it. You know, and, and you know, God makes reference to that. And he said that those that are ashamed of me, he said, of course, he would be ashamed of them or those that don't confess him before men, he would not he would not be released to confess him before the heavenly Father and the angels which are in heaven. So never make a mis- don't make a mistake of, uh, in understanding that what we do down here, how we conduct ourselves down here, doesn't affect what God wants to do from up there. Are, are you still with me? If we're sh- ashamed of him down here. He's ashamed of us before the heavenly Father and his angels, angels in heaven. If we're unwilling to confess him down here, then, then that slams the door. That stops him from being able to be released to confess us before the Father. Jesus confess us before the Father and angels in heaven. So there's a direct relationship between earth and heaven, heaven and earth. And again, how we conduct ourselves either opens a floodgate for God to move into this earth realm and begin to, to, you know, enact or bring his purposes to pass, you know, not only in our behalf, but, you know, it's so important for us to realize that he's bringing his purpose through us, amen, to impact our generation. And I'm telling you this, preaching, you know, standing on a corner, yelling out and screaming, is not going to reach a lot of people. You know, and it might reach someone here or there, but, but um, you know, uh, we have to understand that our life, Paul talked, uh, talked about our life being a living epistle. An epistle is a letter or a word. And so he simply said this, our life, the way that we conduct ourselves in this earth, you know, our behavior, the results of our life, our testimony, it's a written epistle. It is, it is a living, breathing document of God's Word being manifested, God's Word in action and being lived out that impacts the lives of others. Now, I'm going to say that again. This is, you know, you know, religion makes it complicated. God did not make it complicated. You know, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but he'll live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What is that word? It is the word of life. God gave us, gave us his word for us to live by that word. God gave us his word because as we live by that word, that word produces a power to sustain, to sustain a sustaining power for us and our own. Not only a sustaining power for us and our own, but we become a conduit again by which God can begin to reach out to others and begin to lift others. And so make, m- make no mistake about this. If people, you know, in the workplace know you're a Christian, family members know you're a Christian, they are watching you. They are watching you. And so, you know, it's vital for us to understand that our lives, you know, God intends our lives to influence those that we come in contact with every day. You know, he said, Jesus talked about himself as being the light of the world. But then as he wrapped up his ministry, he told his disciples, now you are the light of the world. Now that simply means this, Jesus was an influence wherever he went. He was an influence. He was a positive influence for the kingdom of God. He was an influence that impacted the people that were, you know, he came in contact with. And there was an ever-increasing expansion of God's kingdom that came as a result of that influence. 
And so God said this. He said, you, you know, just like Jesus was the light of the world and he was a, he was a influence to those he came in contact with, you and I are the light of the world and we're to be a positive God, you know, God-ordained influence to those that are around us. Are, are you still with me? And so I don't think we've understood that God is into influence. Sometimes we have a tendency to think, well, you know, people that have a lot of influence, they're basically bad. Well, Jesus had a lot of influence. He had so much influence when he was born, kings were worried about him. And that influence was expanded, you know, and that influence grew. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why they moved to, to um, you know, try to constantly exterminate him or kill him or destroy him well, but because they were afraid of the influence that was being generated by his life and ministry. And so he said, I'm the light of the world or I'm an influence, the influence of the world. He said, now, you are the light of the world and now you're to be the influence of the world. And so, you know, so many times as Christians, we have this thing backwards and we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to fight off the influence of the world, which we, we should. But I tell you what, we can get so wrapped up in the Lord, so wrapped up in the things of God, and so wrapped up in the Word of God, and our life so wrapped up in it that, that we're not constantly fighting off that stuff we become a moving, moving, breathing, walking influence of the Lord in this earth. Are, are you still with me? And, and so, you know, you and I are to be the light of the world. So, you know, when we talk in terms of 2011 straight from heaven, we're talking in terms of heaven is going to influence this earth. And God wills for there to be a heavenly, you know, manifestation the touch of heaven, the manifestation of God's very best in and through our lives that is a testimony, and it is a light to the people. Now, let's try to read here in Deuteronomy. It says in verse 8, it says, Therefore, well, look at verse 7. It says, But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord that he did. Therefore, because of this, keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land wherever you go to possess it, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that flows or overflows with milk and honey. Or you could say it this way, a land of plenty, a wealthy place, a land of abundance. Now, there's several things here because he says this. He says, now, if we'll, um, if we'll obey the Lord. Now, you know, some people say, well, you're reading out of the Old Testament, you know, and, and I'm a, I'm a born-again Christian, and I'm, you know, basically I'm in the New Testament, and the Old Testament doesn't have any bearing on my life. Listen, you have been deceived. The Bible says clearly in the New Testament, I'm going to say that again. The Bible says clearly in the New Testament, referring to God's people Israel, they're referred to as the church in the wilderness. And it's interesting because there's a parallel that runs. You know, there's types and shadows and examples that you see in, you know, in Israel, God's people, and them being delivered out of Egypt. For instance, when they were brought out of Egypt, you know, it was a result of the power of God being manifest, but it was manifest based upon, now listen closely, it was rooted in and based upon that Passover lamb giving, giving its innocent life in the place of them. Now listen closely. He said, you take a lamb for each household. He said, that lamb is going to be sacrificed. And he said, that lamb, that innocent lamb is going to die in essence. And it was, it was that lamb that is talked about there was a firstborn lamb, one of the firstlings of the flock, which Jesus, you know, he, the Bible reveals him as the, you know, 
when he came into this earth, he was the only begotten of God. He was the firstborn of God. He's referred to as the first fruits of God. And so that lamb, the, innocent, the blood of that innocent lamb was shed, and then he said, now that blood must be applied. He said, each household must have, you know, the blood applied to the side post and to the lintel. Now, you know, this simple illustration, but if you draw a line from the middle of that lintel or, or upper, upper door support, draw it down, just draw a line to the ground from there, and draw a line across from side post to side post, what do you get? You get the picture, representation, or symbol of the cross. And when God brought Israel out of Egypt and delivered them by his outstretched hand or by his mighty power, it was a type and, and, and a shadow pointing towards you and I being delivered out of darkness and delivered out from under the devil's power. Of course, Colossians chapter 1 talks about this. We have been delivered from the power of darkness, translated over into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Then he makes another statement, in whom we have redemption. We have redemption even the forgiveness of our sins. And so, you know, literally what he said, we've been delivered from the power of darkness just like Israel was delivered out of Egyptian bondage. And the blood represents the covenant. That blood was shed for the remission of our sins. That blood of that innocent lamb, you know, uh, the Passover lamb was shed, again, as a substitute for them. And then what happened? God brought them out of Egypt just like God delivered us from the power of darkness. And he brought them out of Egypt, now listen closely, to take them into the promised land. And that promised land represents, now listen closely, our redemption that is found and belongs to us in Christ Jesus. He said he brought them out to take them into a land of plenty a land of more than enough. And so God brought us out, delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son, in whom we have redemption. There are things that belong to us. But just like they, you know, went, he said he brought them out to take them in the promised land. Well, they came out of Egypt. They were to go through the wilderness and go in and take the promised land, but they stalled out in the wilderness. And basically, the Bible said they stalled out in the wilderness and were destroyed in the wilderness because uh, of, of an unwillingness to believe God, an unwillingness to take the gospel, which according to Hebrew, the book of Hebrews chapter 2 there, it says the gospel, or chapter 3, it says the gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. Now, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? The gospel was preached unto them, talking about Israel, the church in the wilderness as well as the gospel was preached unto us. Now, where was the gospel preached unto them? It was preached unto them through the Passover lamb in type and shadows. It was also preached unto them when they, when they approached, you know, were out in the desert, they needed water, they approached the bitter waters of Mara, the poisonous waters of Mara, and... Um, you know, they said, what are we going to do? I mean, you drink that water, you're going to die, but you can't live out in this desert wilderness without water. God showed Moses a tree. He said, I want you to pull that tree out of the ground. I want you to cast it in those waters. When that tree was lifted up out of the ground and that tree was, you know, pulled up, in other words, you have a tree that's living, you pull it up by the roots, you pull it out of the ground, that tree is going to give its life in the place of someone else or something else, cast into the waters, the bitter waters were made sweet. And that's where God declared that I'm not only the one that delivered you out of Egypt, I am Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord God, your healer. So he was saying there's not only redemption, you know, and forgiveness and deliverance, you know, in that covenant, there's healing in that covenant. And so, you know, we could go on, and you remember the serpent on the pole? 
when the poisonous snakes, you know, came throughout the camp. And, um, you know, they refused to obey God again. And, and, and they got out from under the protective, the protection of God. Those serpents, the Bible said the serpents were, the wilderness was full of those serpents. I mean, if you read the, the, the you know, record, you'll find if you pull the scriptures together that deal with that account, it says that, that, that area that they were in, it was full of serpents already. It was only the protective hand of God that kept the serpents off of them. But when they got out from under God's protective covering, the serpents began to bite them. And they began to be poisoned. But how many of you know that God showed Moses that he was, you know, he was to uh, uh, take the pole and that serpent was to be hung up on the pole and that, that serpent symbolized man's transgression and sin. And it symbolized Jesus, Jesus would be lifted up on that cross and he would be lifted up as a substitute bearing the sins of the whole human race. And how many of you know that when that, was, that, that servant was lifted up on the pole, that he said he want anyone that looked upon that and gazed upon it and studied, about, studied it, I mean, fixed their attention on it, the Bible says they were healed. Have you ever wondered what it means to live under an open heaven? Or ever wonder what God meant by living on earth as it is in heaven? You can find the answers in Pastor Shepard's new series, Living Under an Open Heaven, in 2011. What was the true Bible meaning of Jacob's Ladder? And what part do angels play in God's will for your life? These end time questions and more will be answered in this four CD set. To order this powerful series, call us today or write to us. You can reach us by calling 713-943-9815, where our staff is standing by right now to take your call. Or write to us at Prevailing Faith Today, 3255 Strawberry, Pasadena, Texas, 77504. Please enclose your love gift of $25 or more, plus shipping and handling, and be sure to mention the order number that's on the screen. Please allow two weeks for delivery. Call today. If you are ever in the Houston area, please join us for one of our weekly church services. Our Sunday morning service begins at 10 a.m. Our Sunday evening service begins at 7 p.m. And our midweek service starts on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. We are located just two miles off the Beltway between Spencer and Fairmont. 